Okay, <clears throat> good evening, good evening, good evening, Edwin. Nice to see you. <clears throat> um, I'm reporting here in Claremont, California. The date is uh, July 20th. This is week number seven of business finance. And this recording is going out to two courses or two classes of business finance, the remote class and the online class for week number seven. And I want to thank you all for uh, my uh, strange videos and strange communications of the last uh, 10 days or so as I was back in Michigan taking care of some elderly parents, which is not fun, but it's your obligation as the oldest son and the oldest child to take care of that. So that's what I've been doing back and forth to Michigan a variety of times over the last few weeks. And uh, now I have another sister there who's kind of holding the fort and I have to go back again as soon as our class time is over in August. So <clears throat> that's where we stand now. But it, to your advantage, and I've cleaned up the course a little bit, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight as we head into our last two weeks. You have posted uh, assignment number three, and I'll be doing that grading in the next day or so and posting those grades along with the, a video explaining that because I know that was a difficult assignment, some lot of things to do, and uh, you'll get some um, um, feedback on that because you're going to have another question very similar to that, similar work on your final examination. And now, as you can see on the uh, agenda in front of you, the final examination, it says is due July 31st, but it would be posted on July 27th. That is uh, a typo. The posting of the final examination will be this coming Sunday, July 24th. You'll have a week to do the work. Our class lecture and our class next week for the remote students on July 27th will be a review and question and answer for that examination uh, for that. So uh, final examination and your last grade will be posted this Sunday, due July 31st. And the final examination will cover the entire course. And I will post after this session tonight a outline of what the final examination will cover. Today in this lecture video, we'll be covering chapters 16 and 17, some specific sections in those chapters in regards to debt and dividends. We'll be looking at a video that very well or very uh, precisely explains debt financing and capital structure. And then I wanna show you something here. Let me just bring this up. If you go to your Blackboard and go to the course syllabus schedule information, I have updated that schedule. I have, isn't this nice news? I have canceled assignment number four, which was due to be given this week. You will not have an assignment four in this class. Your last work in this class is the final examination that will be posted on Sunday, July 24th. This is for both sections of business finance and it'll be due Sunday, July 31st. Many of you have already received, probably from the university, your course evaluation information. Uh, that work will be due August 2nd. If you post your course evaluation, you will get your final course grade on Wednesday, August 3rd. And more about that course evaluation later. Uh, and naturally, I don't expect you to do it now. We still technically have two weeks of course left. So you'll do that evaluation later if you do it at all. But the course evaluation has no effect of your course grade. You don't lose any points. You don't gain any points. All it is is merely tell your professor, me, uh, about the course. And I know in the course of eight weeks over the summer, this course has probably flown by and you probably can't even remember half the stuff we've done. Uh, but we'll talk more about that later. But the main thing about this week's week seven is you do not have an assignment number four this week. I've incorporated that work in your final examination. I took a look at assignment four last night and I said, geez, they just got done doing a spreadsheet more work this weekend, and then additional work the next week, I didn't think that was very fair. 
especially with me being out of town so much and kind of wacko, I thought it'd be easier to, to incorporate our last work in the final examination. It makes it a lot easier for you all to do your work. And also we'll have a review session during that next week where I can help you and go over some key parts of that examination. So I think that'll be a good thing to do. And I think it keeps the burden of additional work off you, but at the same time, it allows you to do good work and we'll cover all the material that we need to cover in this class. So that's the plan. Assignment number three grades will be posted this weekend and the reviews, review video. Next week on Sunday, July 24th, I will post your final examination work. There is no assignment for this week, just the final posted on the 24th, due the 31st. And then <clears throat> uh, we're done. The course will be wrapped up. We'll have a review session a week from today. And that review session will be available to both sections of business finance. And we can go from there. Now, let's say, and let's just be a hypothetical. Let's say you bombed assignment three. Let's say you didn't do very good on assignment three, uh, which is a possibility. Uh, but that's okay. Well, that's not okay. But I will review the work with your, when I grade the assignments, post a review video, and then basically you'll have another shot at capital budget analysis on the final examination. You'll have another question fairly similar to the one on assignment three, but it'll be on the final examination. Another work involving capital budget analysis, weighted average cost of capital, and so on. So we'll talk about that in our review and let me grade the work first before I make any accusations about people bombing the uh, assignment. I, that's not very right if you're a professor to say that. I'm just going by past work in the course. Uh, some students have had a difficult time with that, but we have plenty of time to review that and study for it on the final examination. No assignment for, so don't anybody freak out if you go to your syllabus and say, wait a minute, Hassie just told me there's no assignment four, but there's assignment four here. I've updated it. It's all located here, the updated important dates for your course. Okay, so if we go now to our work this week, notice there's no graded work for this week. We have this Zoom session tonight. We're talking about chapters 16 and 17. There'll be a subsequent video this weekend covering assignment three, covering capital budget analysis, and that will be a good review because you're going to have a question on that on the uh, final examination. Now, let me stop right here. And Jamie, I, Jaime, I still, Jamie, I still see that you just came on. I'm glad. And uh, does anybody have any questions of me at this point in time? Nothing right now. So um, the only question I have is regarding the investment portfolio. Yes. Um, do we need to do an update or will that be part of the final? That will be part of the final, Edmund. You'll have to update, and I'll just give you an advance notice. You'll have to update your portfolio as of Friday, July 29th. Okay. And there'll be some subsequent questions and an essay involving that portfolio. And we'll talk about that in the review session next week. But the evaluation of your final valuation of your portfolio will be July 29th, Friday, at the end of the uh, business trading day. You'll update your portfolio, and then you'll answer some questions on the final with what your portfolio tells you, how you did over the course. And we'll see who the Wolf of Wall Street is also at that time. OK? Any other questions? Uh, just one. Yes, sir. Regarding, I uh, was reading on the uh, uh, stocks, uh, the beta. So my understanding is that anything below one, it's a conservative investment and anything over one will be a little more risky. Yeah, is that I think, right yeah, that's exactly that? right. I, I would put it in different wordage. I would say if your beta is under one, it means that the chance of you not having consistent returns is less. And I mean, it's better. I mean, 
uh, you know, what it does, it takes, for example, let me give you a real world. Right now, the average return on the S&P 500 is 9%, okay, 9%. If you take that average return over the course of four years or 16 quarters, that comes out to about 9.75%, okay? So let's say you have Apple stock. Apple stock has a return right now of roughly about, it's not impressive, they've had a rough little go, about 7.5%. So right now there's a delta between 7.5% and 9% average return in the market, average re and the return of Apple. If you do that analysis quarter by quarter, going back four years, you'll come up with a standard deviation between the two, market average and Apple. I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible while totally confusing you. When you do that analysis, you'll come up with a beta. Apple's beta is currently 1.22, meaning they've made money and they've done well over the last four years for 16 quarters, but they haven't been as consistent as the market averages. In other words, one quarter they do go up and then the next quarter, maybe they go down or then they go down again and then they go up. OK, it's like a roller coaster. The higher the beta, it means more of a roller coaster of the returns compared to the market averages. So if you have a beta under one, it means you're even more consistent than the market averages. You are okay. even real, even keel. You're more consistent. Doesn't mean you're making any more money. It just means the roller coaster is not a roller coaster, if, if right. that makes sense. Sure. And then, yeah, so the, I, I was just... Noticing Costco has a, a beta of 0.65 yes. versus Apple of one to two. So exactly. So Apple is, you probably made more money with Apple anyways than Costco, but as far as the comparison to the market averages, Apple has a little bit more variance, a little bit more deviation, where Costco is a little bit more stable. That's okay. all it tells you. So beta basically tells... I'm going to use this expression because it's all guys here in this uh, forum here. Uh, beta, the, the higher the beta, the tighter your underwear gets. The lower the beta, you're wearing boxer shorts. Basically what it is. Because okay. tighter underwear means you're uncomfortable. You're doing okay, but you're always fidgeting. You always think, you always, something's always uneasy because it's a roller coaster. You're, you're, very, you're deviating more from the market. Right. Okay, okay, I get it. So yeah, that's why Tesla has like a 2.22. Exactly. <laughs> Talk about a roller coaster. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And 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 delta means a change. Change. Or exactly. Difference? A change. A difference. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And especially a Tesla uh, announced their earnings today for the last quarter, June 30th, and they had a loss. For the first time in a year, they lost money. So that's really going to play havoc with their beta. <laughs> that's really, it's going to go up even more. Very inconsistent. Still, the stock price is holding its own, but their profits and everything else in their return is a little bit up and down and over and about. And that's why they have a such, if you can live with the roller coaster and stomach it, do it. But if you're conservative and like it nice and quiet, Stay away from high beta. Okay, but that's a great question. That's a good question. Calculating beta is a royal pain in the neck, but that's why you let other people do that. If this was a statistics course, we would learn how to calculate beta, but no. In this class, we're learning how to interpret it, what it tells us. And that's why it's included in your portfolio. That this should give you a different interpretation of how your stock varies to the market averages. Okay, very good. Good question. Okay, so uh, that's where we stand. I think we're in pretty good shape. We'll crunch 16 and 17 tonight. I'm, right now I'm gonna put on a video that talks about debt and financing, which is a great, it's kind of a fun video too. It's one of the better videos that I show. Most of my videos are kind of boring, but this is a good video. So we're gonna listen to that. Then we're gonna talk about the highlights of chapters 16 and 17. And that'll put us in good shape to for me in the next day or so to grade your assignment three, put together a video about that, and then we'll and I'll post a outline of what your final examination is going to cover, and then we're in good shape for our last week. You don't have to worry about any graded 
work this week unless, and we do have some students who are still on extension for assignment three, so that's fine. They've been approved to take an extension on assignment three. That take your time and get that done to me by this weekend, and I'll grade them, and we're off and running heading into our final week. All right, so I think that's a good thing. All right, so now uh, I'm going to just pause this and let me get caught up in my computer and I'll bring up that video that we're going to watch and introduce it. So just give me a minute, please. Okay, there's a very, uh, and if any, some of you might be aware of this, there's a wonderful uh, program, a business program done on NPR, National Public Radio, public radio. And it's on every morning and every afternoon. It's called Marketplace. If you ever wanna know what's going on in five minutes or what's going on in the economy and the world around us, uh, Marketplace on for five minutes every morning and five minutes every afternoon at the close of the markets is a wonderful podcast. It's a wonderful place to get information. And the gentleman who produces this uh, marketplace has put together a variety of videos talking about subject matters involving economics and finance. And the subject of this is the subject of our topic this week, capital structure. In other words, debt financing or corporate financing. Remember, Capital structure is the right-hand side of a balance sheet. It's the debt and equities that finance assets. Well, how you strategize and how you manage that capital structure can make or break a company. And this gentleman here who uh, is a producer of Marketplace has put together a video using the background of a airplane <laughs> of all things of an airplane to explain capital structure and corporate financing. It's pretty clever. And I think it's pretty basic where any student can kind of understand after he gets done explaining this, what we're talking about. And then as the video, after the video is over, I'll talk more about it in regards to our textbook, uh, in regards to our course. So let's watch this video. It's about uh, six minutes, seven minutes long and about capital structures, pretty clever. Hi, my name is Paddy Hirsch. I'm a senior editor at Marketplace. And today I want to talk about capital structure. The reason being because it's integral to this whole issue of swapping debt for equity or preferred stock for common stock. In order to understand how all of that works, you need to have a good feel for how the capital structure of a company works. So uh, we've shopped around for a little analogy that we could use to describe capital structure. And here's one that we came up with. So here is uh, your average uh, passenger airplane. Okay. All right. It's, uh, okay, it's kind of a wonky looking aircraft, but we can all recognize it by the wings and the tail and the fact that uh, this is a slightly unusual aircraft because it's only got uh, one exit door at the front here, okay? Only one door. Here's the ramp that comes out. And uh, the aircraft is configured along the normal lines. At the front of the aircraft, we have first class. Then we've got business. Then we've got uh, this new thing that you'll see if you go on board the aircraft these days, in particular American Airlines, I can say with experience, which is the, uh, the, the um, it's like the uh, Coach Plus. Okay, so we have Plus. And then after that, of course, we've got Coach. Everyone in the rear with the gear. Now, if this aircraft 
uh, lands heavily on the ground or crashes, all right? Because it's only got one door, it means there's a very specific uh, exit routine for everybody. First class gets out first, business class comes out next, then it's coach plus, and then coach. Everybody's going to have to come out in that order. And that's kind of like what it's like for a company uh, whenever a company collapses, okay? Because these classes um, also equate to certain asset classes. So like first class are the loans, okay? Business class are like the bonds. Plus, uh, plus coach class is like preferred stock, okay? And then coach class is like common stock, okay? So why do, these, uh, why do these asset classes equate to these sort of classes on board the aircraft? Well, it's all about risk, okay? The further back in the plane that you sit, the more risk that you take, okay? Because if the plane crashes, then it's less likely that you're going to get out if the, uh, you know, because of the, the, the priority of exit. So say this, pl uh, if this, say this plane cr uh, crashes, the loan holders get out first, then the bond holders, then the preferred stockholders, then the common stockholders. And when, and when they, they get out whole, that is to say they get all their money back. Okay, so if we look at this, uh, these delineations here, you see that they kind of fall into two. We have debt here, which is the loans and the bonds, and then you have equity. Okay, but uh, preferred equity is slightly different because preferred equity looks like equity, but it's actually structured more like debt because there's this payment every uh, every month that uh, that the uh, the company has to make. So all of these issues here. These asset classes, loans, bonds, and preferred stock, these guys all receive, or these people all receive a payment every month. Okay? So now if we look at this, this, uh, this debt and equity tranche, we can see that, um, that we, can, we can see what the, the company's leverage is, what its ratio of debt to equity is. So say in this case we have a, an equity ratio, a debt to equity ratio of six to one. Okay? It means that there's six times the amount of debt than there is to, to the amount of equity. Okay, now if a plane, even at that, those leverage ratios, a plane can sort of fly straight and level, you know, no problems, as long as it's making enough money to service the debt, as to say, to keep paying the loans, the interest rate on the loans and the bonds, and to keep paying the preferred shareholders. But what happens whenever the company starts making less money, say in a recession? Well, suddenly it starts to head towards the ground. You know, in the case of Chrysler, it starts to go to, you know, head towards a crash. So what, what happens? Well, you want to right the aircraft. And one of the ways to write it is to convert some of these issues, some of these asset classes, into common stock. Okay, so you could ask the preferred stockholders, say, to convert to common stock. And what will that do? Well, it means that you've got, you don't have to pay so much every month because you don't have to pay these preferred shareholders. And maybe you go to the bondholders and you say, hey, guys, you know, would you mind converting your bonds to common stock? And, you, and if you did that, if you managed to convince them to do that, well, once again, you know, you've reduced the amount of interest payment that you have to make every month. But it also reduces your leverage. So say, for example, these preferred guys and these bond guys, they all decided to convert to common stock. Well, what does that do? Well, it means that you've cut your leverage down. Your leverage is now down to, say, two to one. Okay? It means you're flying much more steadily. It means you've got much more people in coach now. Okay, coach is much larger. Ec your equity is much larger in comparison to your debt, which means that you've rebalanced the aircraft and you're flying much more straight and level again. Okay, so what's the incentive of these people to convert their bonds or their preferred stock into common stock? Well, the incentive is that if you don't do that, there's a possibility that the plane could or the company could founder, the company could hit the ground. And if the company does hit the ground, then it's going to, we're talking about a liquidation or a, bank, a bankruptcy and potentially a liquidation. And if there is a liquidation, well, you're going to have to be assessing the situation and saying to yourself, okay, if this, if this plane is liquidated, how much likelihood is there that I'm going to get my money back? Because the people that are going to get their money back first are the guys in first class, the loan holders. Only, once the, only when the loan holders are completely paid off are the bondholders going to get their money. And only when the bondholders are totally paid off is everybody else going to get their money. So if you're a bondholder in this case and you're thinking about converting to common stock, you're going to say to yourself, am I going to get my money back if we crash? Or is it better for me to try and rebalance the aircraft, take a haircut, a so-called haircut, that is to say convert uh, your bonds into equity, which is probably going to be worth less than the bonds are worth at this point, but with the... Uh, the the, the thoughts that if the plane starts to pull up, if the company starts to improve, then your equity is going to be worth more further down the line. That's the decision that these people have to make. And that's, and that's the, uh, the case that's made to them whenever the company or the restructuring managers or whatever it may be are trying to get people to convert from debt or from preferred stock into common stock in order to rebalance the balance sheet of the company, in order to rebalance the capital structure and make it uh, more likely that the company will survive. Of course, 
<laughs> the bondholders may decide, you know what, maybe we'll wait to see what happens if the, if the plane steams into the ground. Maybe we'll wait to see how bad the crash is. Maybe we'll wait to see what the recovery potential of the company is and whether or not I can get paid out at the end. But let me tell you, on the way down, while the plane is heading down and they're making that decision, if they make the wrong decision and everything crashes, well, it's going to leave everybody, even the first class, the loan holders, everybody, very badly, needing a drink. So that's a, that's a very simple but very accurate way of looking at capital structure in regards to this airplane. And the way that financial managers manage their companies is to lower risk, because if risk is lower, the returns can be greater to the investors. There's less likelihood for, as you can say, see here, a plane crash. So what managers need to do is balance this capital structure so it's efficient, but at the same time, which he doesn't mention here, providing the proper capital to run your company, providing the proper money uh, to the company. And what fuels the jet aircraft? Gasoline or, de or fuel, jet fuel. Where does that jet fuel come? Well, that's your operations. That's your operating funds. And your operating funds are providing that fuel to keep the plane flying at an even keel. And in the case of economic troubles, a pandemic, whatever, competition, if either or fuel does not get to the aircraft or fuel becomes valuable or not available, or that capital structure is in disarray, it can cause for a very bumpy plane ride. And that's exactly what uh, what this exercise does. So I think it's a great example of, of how finance managers have to keep a, be aware of this in, in order to run their companies. Now, speaking along those lines, here's a couple key points in chapter 16, which talks about debt. Remember, and you know, again, we've been through this many times throughout our course. The key thing of, of corporate finance is to find that mix of debt and liabilities and equities to make sure your company is having enough funds to manage the assets of the company and at the same time creating value, creating wealth in your business. It's just like uh, what you and I go through <coughs> Every excuse me, every day in our own personal financial management, we get a paycheck, we spend the operating funds of our family life on the paycheck to get food, clothing, and the and that up. We use part of that paycheck to pay off debt and obligations, and the whatever is left over, we invest in retirement. We invest in investments that are hopefully going to create value and return for us into the future. Now, when it does come time for us to use credit and borrow money, we have a, a balance of credit card debt and then long-term debt. That long-term debt is if we wanna buy a house, if we wanna buy a car, if we wanna make some long-term debt position. So how do we pay off that long-term debt? Well, we generate cash flow from our paychecks and gradually pay it down over time. But we get the opportunity. We get the value of owning that asset by having the ability to use credit to get the, debt, to get the asset from the debt. So capital structure is creating value. Hopefully, if you keep the leverage down and like the airplane and you manage and balance that correctly, you're going to produce a good firm. So one of the things that he talked about in that video is what happens if the company gets in trouble and you have to restructure. It's changing and moving the capital structure around without changing the other side of the accounting equation, assets. So you leave the assets alone, but you, make, you change the mix of debt and equity to make the company less leveraged in regards to interest payments and principal payments keeping your cash flow at a minimum. Remember, in an airplane, in the example we used, or in, in capital financing, your blood, your operations, your jet fuel is the profits and the cash flow that you're creating in your company. If there's a cutoff of that cash flow or profits, if there's a halt or a lowering of those, you're going to be in trouble. And the less amount of debt you have and fixed expensive or fixed costs, that restructuring will prove valuable in how you manage your business.
Nope, oh, you're going through here. I don't want to get in that. Here's an example of that. Here's a company that's financed entirely by equity. Entirely by equity. No debt whatsoever. So they have 1 million shares, excuse me, 100,000 shares at a price per share of 10 bucks. The company is financed with a million dollars. With that financing, if they're in an economic condition that's expected, they're earning about $1.25 a share or 12.5%. If there's a slump, they're, they're still earning money, but not as much. And if there's a boom, they're earning a lot more money. That's if they're 100% equity financed. But if they decide to restructure the company, remember back here, they had a million dollars market value and it was all equity. Now they're going to have a million dollars market value, but half of it is in debt. Half of it is in equity. So they've restructured the company to take half of the assets and fund it by debt instead of all equity. Now, what has that done? Well, in the operating income side, now they have the additional burden of interest costs. So that's going to lower their earnings down by $50,000. Their earnings per share is a buck 50. But the return on their shares, because there's less shares of stock, is 15%. That's compared to here, when it's all equity, basically the stockholders are not earning any more money. The relationship of the return is lower than if you add debt financing to it. By restructuring, they're actually making more money for the shareholders. <laughs> now, how does a company go about doing that? Well, in the case of this example, they would buy back some of the shares of stock or convert some of the shares of stock to debt. All right, you can give us your stock and we'll, you're going to, we're going to, you're like, it's like loaning us the money and we'll pay you interest. It's like a bond. But that's what, that's why companies constantly restructure. By putting debt in this, they're actually, the equity holders, the stockholders are making more money. Kind of weird, huh? But that's a great way of a good example of restructuring your capital structure. Here's another graph of looking at it. It's looking at your profits and ex expectations of operating income and also what share you start making money at. And as you can see, you're earning more earnings per share when you reduce the equity value of the business. So that's, that's an interesting thing. And here's another example of it. <clears throat> Notice in these examples of finance, we're looking at different stages of the economy. And as a financial manager, you need to do this. And you should do this in your own personal financing. What do I mean by that? Today's economy, I would consider it, probably for most of it, maybe a slump or expected. Why? High inflation. Maybe we might, be, some of us might be laid off. I and mean, it's an awful subject to talk about, but you have to be prepared for it. We're kind of maybe on the verge of a slowdown, maybe even a recession. We'll see what the June 30th GDP looks like. If the GDP goes down June 30th, we're in a recession. That's two consecutive quarters of a drop in the economic growth of the country. So everybody's waiting to see that. At the same time, what happens if all of a sudden we turn it around and get into a boom. There's different ways of interpreting return based on the way the economy is. So even though you're managing your company as best as you can, the economy is gonna drive the return of your business because that controls the amount of customers you have and your cost and everything like that. So when you have a equity financed or a debt replicated to investors, notice the, you have interest as part of your earnings that reduces your net profits, but because you have less equity, you're returning a higher amount of the investment. And that's what companies, that's kind of like the spin of companies. 
business is bad, but we restructured our company, so our shareholders are still going to make a good return or a good percentage return on their investment. It's a very important concept, and you see it every day in business and in the Wall Street Journal and in business news. Very, very prevalent. Now, what does that do to the value of a company? Well, it creates a split. <clears throat> if you're equity financed, the equity value is a million dollars. But if you die, decide to restructure 50-50 or $500,500, that income is going to be changed because of the interest you're incurring. And that's what they've been talking about in these charts. And one of the key things of being in a business or financial management is to be able to take the macro view of how your strategies affect your business. And this is definitely a macro view. We're not looking at specifics of what makes up our $125,000 in operating income, what part is, and all that. And remember, operating income is revenue minus expenses before interest and taxes, right? That's what operating income is. Operating income is revenues and expenses of the operations of your business. Then when you include debt, in this case, $50,000, that's your interest. So your true income to equity or profits is reduced by that 50,000 and 75,000. What they don't include here is, and I know why, is the tax implication because taxes and at this level of income, you might be tax-free in your business. So that's why they don't include it. But this, this is what you're getting at. Whenever somebody tells you, well, our operating income is 125,000, that does not mean their profit. It means that's the sales minus the operating expenses. And then that leads you to looking at, oh, well, what happens if we have some interest? All right, then our operating income or our equity profit then now is reduced by that interest. So those are key macro views lo at looking at financing and restructuring along the lines of that airplane. But every day, I shouldn't say every day, but every quarter, example, this week is July 18th through the 22nd. We're now three weeks from June 30th. June 30th was the end of the second quarter of this calendar year. So after June 30th, every corporation in America has produced financial reports, new beta analysis, new working capital analysis, new cost of capital, weighted average cost of capital analysis, all the things that you guys have been doing in this class. And right now, this week and next, they call this the earnings season. This is when companies announce their performance through June 30th. So all these numbers that you see in front of you are probably going to change as those earnings are announced. A great example is yesterday. Netflix announced their earnings. Netflix had a drop in profits. Why? They lost 2 million users of Netflix. 2 million, 2 million customers signed off of Netflix and probably went to Hulu or so those, one of those other things. But they lost 2 million subscribers. And that greatly influenced the company. But today, Facebook stock, I mean, Facebook, Netflix stock was up 8%. They announced lower earnings last yesterday, but today the stock was up. Isn't that weird? Well, it's not weird because here's why. Yesterday, when that announcement was made, a lot of people sold their Netflix stock and the people who bought the stock today think that they're buying the stock cheaper and they're getting into the market buying what they think is maybe giving Netflix a time to come back and get those subscribers and make some money. Also, Netflix is thinking about restructuring, allocating different resources for their assets. Today, another example, Tesla announced their earnings today and Tesla lost money June 30th. They lost money. That's the first quarter in the last year of the last four quarters that Tesla has lost money. Naturally, 
that's going to affect their stock. And it'll be interesting to see what Tesla opens up tomorrow. But they announced their earnings after the market closed today, so it didn't affect the stock price. But it'll be interesting to see what happens to Tesla stock tomorrow. So again, earnings season. This is when companies announce their performance and then investors take a look at it and say, hmm, is this a good thing for me? Then I'll hold on to the stock. If it's a bad thing for me, hmm, I'll sell the stock. If you don't own the stock, is this a good thing for me? Yeah, maybe I'll buy the stock tomorrow or this week when it's cheaper. And that's how the game is played. In regards to that, let's take a look at this. Another key thing that's happening now during earnings season is that companies to determine their dividend payout schedule. This is the time of year after a quarter that the board of trustee, board of directors of a company and the management team decide, all right, how do we reward our investors for the past quarter? Are we going to pay a dividend and distribute our profits? Or are we going to not pay a dividend and keep the money? Well, I got a letter from Ford Motor Company two days ago. I should have put, put, that, put that letter up on the screen. Damn it. Forgot about that. But I got a letter from Ford Motor Company two days ago. Monday. Was it Monday? It was Monday. And in that letter, it says, Rick. And they say, Rick. Oh, how do you know me by Rick? But whatever. Rick, we are not going to pay you a dividend this July based on our June 30th financials. We are not paying a dividend. This is the first time we're not paying a dividend in over a couple of years in the quarter ending June 30th. For me, no big deal because I know what Ford's doing. I track them, I follow them. What Ford is doing is they're now building up their electric car market. They're gearing up to gradually change over their automobile fleet to all electric as they see those days are coming. They're putting a lot of money into their F-150, that monster of a truck, and turning that into an electric automobile. So they need capital to do all this. So they're going to take that dividend that they usually pay. It's usually around 10 cents, 12 cents a share. And they're going to keep it and put it back into the business. For me, as a stockholder, I think in the long term, that's going to make my stock more valuable. But to other stockholders, on Tuesday, a lot of people sold their stock in Ford. You're not giving me a dividend? The hell with you. So that dividend, so what did I do yesterday? I bought more Ford stock because it was cheaper. Everybody got rid of theirs. I bought it for like 10 bucks a share. I got it for about two, two or three dollars below their intrinsic value, their real value. I got it cheap. So I went and bought some. Now, is that going to pay off for me? Mm, knock on wood. Let's hope so. But if not, I thought that was a good opportunity, all because Ford has decided to change their payout policy, the way that they distribute dividends. And why are they telling me that now? because that's the cycle of how you distribute dividends. You have a declaration date, you have an X date, you have a record date, and then you have the payment date. For Ford, this starts in June and ends in late July. Ford usually has a payment date in the last week of July. It's different for every company. So what you wanna do is make sure that you have the, knowing and understanding if you're an investor or even if you're a potential investor that you know exactly what's happening with your company stock but if you're a financial manager you have to be aware of what kind of dividends are we paying are we paying a cash dividend that has a, a payment on physical cash coming out of the company or are we paying other types of dividends are we paying a stock dividend are we splitting the stock just about a month ago, Amazon split their stock. I happen to own stock in Amazon. Amazon stock hasn't been doing very well the last quarter. It's down about 25% this year, 2022. 
Amazon split their stock because let's say back then, and I'll use the Amazon example, Amazon stock was trading at, let's say approximately $2,000 a share. They had a six, I think a six for one split. So what they did is if I owned one share of Amazon at $2,000, I now, if I take $2,000 and divide it by six, I'm now going to get 300 more shares of stock <laughs> at the same value, but now I own more stock. But the stock is worth the same amount. They just lower the price in the market now. The price will be about 300 bucks a share. I'm I'm just doing this off the top of my head, so it's probably a little bit different. But that's what happened. They split the stock. So they didn't have to pay out any cash, but all their stockholders now own more stock. And the big the good side of it is now the price is in the market a lot cheaper. So no more more people can now start buying the stock. Stock dividends, a lot of you work for companies that give you bonuses or give you retirement funds where they give you shares of stock in the company. Stock dividends is another way of distributing wealth to shareholders without spending any cash. And then there's an also the final thing, stock repurchase. About a month ago, I got a letter from Apple Computer. Hey, Rick, thanks a lot for owning our company. I know we see you've owned it since 1987. Good job for sticking with us. I see you own, own X, X amount of shares. We'd like to offer you to buy 50 of your shares of stock at a given price. I told him no. But why would Apple Computer want to give me a check to buy back my stock? Because they want to reduce the number of shares outstanding in the market which will arbitrarily increase the value of the stock because there's less stock to buy, supply and demand. Pretty clever. So instead of getting a stock dividend from Apple this quarter, they offered me to buy back some of my stock. And I told them no. Some people did that. But usually when a company offers to buy back the stock, they think the stock price is gonna go up. <laughs> They think the company is going to be doing better. So they want to make it cheaper on the company. But I did not do that. So you have a variety of different ways of getting distribution from a company. Cash dividends, stock dividends, stock splits, and stock repurchases. Stock repurchases are also called, another name for it is called treasury stock where the company buys back shares of ownership. Kind of weird. The company is basically investing in themselves. They're taking their cash and buying their own stock. And then they're gonna hang on to it. Some companies eventually sell that stock back to the market. And sometimes they just hang on to it as an investment in themselves. Edwin, question. Yes, um, regarding stock repurchases, do they offer you a higher price than the market price when they, Definitely. they ask you? Definitely. When they okay. when this occurred in Apple, I think Apple a month or so ago was traded about around $134, $135. And in the letter they told me, they sent me, they wanted to buy, I'm not going to tell you how many shares of stock I own, but they offered to buy 50 shares from me at $142 a share. Usually the premium above market is anywhere between five and 10%. They were doing it a little bit cheaper. Now, when I said no, get this, Edwin, and good question. When I said no, they sent me a week later, a follow-up email. <laughs> and in that email, it says, we've upped our offer, Rick, to $145 a share. Wow. That was tempting. <laughs> if, they got, if they got up to 150, they would have had me. But uh, Apple, about, Apple about today to ask you is, that, Professor. What yeah. if you were to give them a number? I they don't. When you give them, they a won't number, work that way. It won't work that way. <laughs> this, this is not. This is. And I wish it could. It's not a bidding war. <laughs> but I, I, my broker and I both decided if they offered one fifty, we would sell fifty shares. Now Apple today is trading at about one sixty five, one sixty nine. So they got that stock cheap. They made it, they got that stock cheap. 
And now it's up at 169. Well, once it was 171 the other day, but I think it dropped a little bit. So, so yeah. just to follow up. So once a, a stock repurchase is a treasury, they can then turn around and resell that stock back. Exactly right. To. And if they sell it back at a higher price than what they paid for it, they made some money on themselves. How about that one? But that money really goes back to the shareholder, doesn't it? As no. equity. No. no. Let, let's say, let's use the example of me. Let's say they offered me $145 for 50 shares of stock. Okay. They wrote me a check, $145 times 50, 7,250 bucks. Pretty good. They send me a check for it. Now I have to report this on, on my income. Shoot. But I didn't do this. So they're sending me a check for $7,250. Now on their books, that is now considered, and I'm going to use some accounting terminology here, that's going to be a credit on their equity of their equity position. Excuse me, a debit. In other words, their debit, their equity position is going to drop by $7,250. And they wrote a check for cash, that's the credit, of $7,250. So they lowered their equity position because there's less stock now. But they have those certificates as somewhat of an investment. It's called treasury stock. Let's say this week, Apple said, you know what? We need some extra money. And we just saw that our stock closed at 160. They go to a stock brokerage firm and says, we'd like to offer 50 shares of stock in the market. Who wants to buy them? Let's say, let's say I, I go back into the market and say, okay, I'll buy, I'll buy those stock back from Apple, but I have to come up with $8,000. So I now give Apple a check for $8,000. They give me back those stock certificates. And now I have stock at $160 a share on my books. And now Apple has taken that cash wiped out the credit, uh, the debit on equity, and the difference is, again, income. They made money off that transaction. That's how it works. Accountants don't like it because it's a nightmare. And also, investors don't like it because when they see if they made money on that buying back the stock, they got to pay a hell of a capital gain. I, that's what I was afraid of. I knew I would have to pay. A, I bought that stock that they were wanting it $145, that stock I bought for $98 way back when. I would have had a hell of a capital gain on that. That's why I didn't sell it. I didn't want to mess with my taxes on that. It wasn't worth it. I didn't need the money that bad. But that's how that repurchase of stock plays. And every day in the newspaper, Wall Street Journal especially, they have articles about companies buying back stock from their investors. It happens all the time because the companies know it's a fairly sure thing. If they're going to be buying back stock and reselling it later, they're, they're the best people who know how the company's operating. They know that this is going to turn into a profit because they know they're doing things well. If they don't know they're doing things well, then they wouldn't do this anyways. That's what you have to understand as an investor when they're offering to buy back. The, that's why I always say, no, I'm going to hang on to this because you guys know something that I don't. So I'm going to hang on to this. And I was right. The stock is trading at $170. They must have known something. <laughs> so that's, it's almost like insider trading without breaking the law by them doing that action. Okay. But this is a key part of financial management is how a company balances out these dividends and distributions of income. Now, on the final examination, I'm not going to ask you to do any calculations. I'm going to ask you about, please explain what's the difference between a cash dividend, a stock dividend, a stock split, and a stock repurchase. What is the difference? Explain that. Here it is right here. So I'm going to ask you to, under, to explain that to me. Dividends. It's a way of keeping investors happy without really spending a lot of money in terms of the overall value of the company. But it's the, the biggest, excuse my French, the biggest pain in the ass for managers in business, in a corporation, is keeping the investors happy. That's a tough job because they always want more. And if they're not getting it, they're gonna make your job miserable. They're gonna, they're gonna threaten to sell the stock to a competitor. 
They're going to threaten to fire you. They're going to threaten to do something. And companies want to keep their shareholders nice and quiet so they can do and run the business the way they think it should be done. When you got shareholders telling them how to do their business, that's usually a disaster. And that's how it works. How do they uh, calculate stock dividends? Is that based on a percentage of your ownership or? Here's an example right here. Right here, Edwin, good question. Let's take a look at this example. It's right in your textbook. Let's say a company has 2 million shares currently with an outstanding price of $15 a share. So that's the market price. The company declares a 50% stock dividend. How many shares will be outstanding after dividend is paid? So they have 2 million shares. So they're going to declare a 50% stock dividend. That means they're going to issue 100, uh, 1 million more shares of stock. So now they'll have 3 million shares of equity in the company. So basically, they're going to write stock certificates and give those stock certificates out. And in this case, when it says 50%, usually stock dividends are around 20%, 30%. So you just take how many shares are outstanding. And that's how many they're going to distribute to all the shareholders. That's how that works. But then, okay, after that 1 million additional shares are allocated, what does that do to the stock price of the company? Well, remember, before they had 2 million shares at $15 a share. So the market cap was 30 million. After the dividend, they now have 3 million shares of stock. but and the market value is still 30 million. So now it's gone from $15 a share to $10 a share. Everybody's getting the same amount of money, but now on a per share basis, there's more shares out there. So the stock drops or is reduced in value. But in some cases, companies like that, now it makes it cheaper and people think they're getting a deal when they see the stock cheaper than $15. But there's more stock out there. That's what lowered the value. So make that make sense? The key to stock dividends is how much they declare what percentage of the dividend. You take whatever percent of the outstanding shares, and that's how much stock is distributed. That's so how this, that all works. This, this is basically similar to a stock split where the value remains the same. There's just more shares out there. Exactly. It's just a horse with a different color. Exactly right. Okay, got it. Very good. Thank you. So this is a key part of paying out dividends. Companies manage this all. They have huge departments within every company. It's called the treasury department, investor relations. And they have hundreds of people always working on how they dis should distribute the return to their investors because it's very strategic and it's very political. And you want to make sure these people are happy, but at the same time, maximize the value to the company. And that's how all that is played. So that's the key points of corporate finance. The first point is from chapter 16 in capital structure, how you manage that debt and equity in your business, like that airplane video. And then how do you distribute this income? How do you strategize and distribute the income to your investors in chapter 17? Next week, in our final week, we're going to talk about how companies plan, long-term, short-term planning of a company, how you take all this information that we've studied this week or this summer, and how do you plan into the future? That's where financial managers make their money as far as salaries and payroll. If they can look into the future and plan the company accordingly, you're going to make a lot of money. Now, what do I mean by financial planning? Cash management. I'm sure a lot of you work at companies and there's a, probably a strategy in your company. If you have a bill, you don't pay that until the last day that it's due. You hang on to the money. And if you're collecting money, you try to collect the money as fast as possible. That's cash management. How well you do that can make a company a lot of money and save a lot of money. Yep. There is an incentive to pay early. Exactly. Okay. The incentive is get the cash quicker and we can spend it again. Long-term financial planning is a little bit different. 
most companies always plan one, two, three years in advance of what they think is going to happen. If you go any longer than three years, like four or five, it's all guess. It's all pie in the sky. So it looks good on paper, but it doesn't really mean anything. But you try to plan in increments of three years. I run my own family finances that way. What am I going to spend this year? That's my operations. I know I'm making it sound like I'm a business person running my own private life, but it's true. Next year, I think, all right, what, how much, what is my income going up there next year? Now I'm a retired dude and my only disposable income or change in income is how many courses I teach. But I know pretty much what my income is going to be by my investments and by my social security. Besides that, I can plan out going out one, two, and three years on my operating expense size. My expenses at this age of my life are basically the same every year. I don't have any kids anymore. They're out of the house. I don't have any fixed income expenses. I don't have any debts. My only expenses that could change is we, if we decide to go on a vacation. So I pretty well can map out my cash flow going out. That's long-term planning. Companies do that and they spend a lot of resources, both short-term cash management and long-term in planning into the future. We're going to talk about that next week in our review session in addition. So what uh, to summarize where we stand here, let's bring this back up. We have currently uh, on uh, in our Blackboard, week seven, this is a synopsis of what we talked about this evening. There's the capital structure video. There's an explanation of what I just talked about here. But also you'll see, beginning later on this evening, you'll see an outline of what the final examination is going to be all about, all about which is going to be posted next Sunday. It, you have a week to do it, July 31st. Now. Also, there are extension times available. We can go into the first couple of days of August if you need extra time with that final examination. The final examination is basically gonna cover three main things. Number one, a series of questions about your portfolio that you're gonna update it on July 29th. The second series of questions are very similar to assignment number three, a capital budget analysis again. You're gonna be doing another one of those in a spreadsheet. The difference is that I will not give you the template. You are going to have to create the spreadsheet. Now you already have a template from assignment three, so you could probably use that. And the third area of finance is financial statement analysis. Using what we learned about looking at balance sheets, income statements, financial uh, balance, uh, statement of cash flows, and looking at trends analysis, you're gonna have some questions about financial statement analysis. Those are the three concentrating areas of the final because that puts you in good shape for your future classes in your program. Most specifically, your capstone class. <laughs> the last class that you all will take in your business program is gonna summarize those things, financial statement analysis, capital budgeting analysis, and understanding investments. That's gonna be one of the highlights of that capstone class you will have you know, whenever you do get there, I think it's the, called the 493 class or 495, something along those lines. When you guys get there, you'll see that this is preparing you, preparing you for that last class to get your degree in business and administration. So again, and, J and Jamie, you were a little, you were a bit, because I know you were having is issues, but you're a little bit late, but I re recorded this session and I have wiped out assignment number four. So there's no work this week do this weekend the next work is the final examination which will be posted on sunday due in a week and we will have a review session and question and answer session next wednesday at this time to go over any concerns and i also will probably review assignment three in case some of you had some difficulty with that we'll also review that because you're going to have a question on that and you'll see it when you get the examination on sunday in regards to assignment three. So that's where we are. We're up to date and we're heading to the last rundown or last showdown of this class. 
Gentlemen, do you have any questions? I actually do, Professor. Yes, sir. Um, I'm starting my on call this Friday. So it's kind of good that we don't have anything going on because I'm already working on fumes right now. So next Sunday is when we're getting our final, correct? July 24th, yes. Okay. So we get it on Sunday and then we have till the third, you said the 31st, 31st first. First to get it That's, done. So you have a week to do it. Okay. Because I know now, I'm going to be. But, but if you have, if you need extra time, I'll tell you right up front, the actual, actual late final posting date of that has to be Wednesday, August 3rd, because I okay. have to have the grades in by August 4th. Okay. So the 24th is this Sunday. Yes. Okay. So we'll get it this Sunday. Okay. Yes. Perfect. I'll start busting on it right away. Okay. Okay. Cause but you have, you have, you have basically 10 days to do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, but, okay. and that would I that's that's a good point, Jamie. If you get it on Sunday, look at it. And then if something looks wrong or you don't understand, we can talk right. about it and you can ask questions about it okay. next Wednesday. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think that'll work out good. Perfect. All right. All righty. Edwin, do you have anything else? Uh, no. We're good Wonderful. to go. All right. All right, gentlemen, that's it. I'm going to post this lecture once it gets all fired up through my system. It'll take a couple hours. Look for that final examination review, and I'll see you guys next Wednesday at 530. And if you have any questions when I post the exam this weekend, be sure to let me know. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right, all right guys. Thank we'll see you next time. All right. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.